Continuing here on the exam room broadcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the weight loss champion Chuck Carroll as we march toward the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine 2021 edition. I am so thrilled now to be joined by somebody who's going to be speaking there. Matter of fact, she's going to be kicking things off on that Thursday, one of the first speakers right out of the gate. But we have her here first on the exam room. She is a consultant hematologist and honorary senior lecturer at King's College Hospital. She founded Plant Based Health Professionals UK in 2017, and just this past January, co-founded the UK's first regulated online plant-based lifestyle medicine healthcare service, Plant-Based Health Online. She is an incredible individual, and she is here today to talk about cancer prevention and survival. With that, we welcome Dr. Shireen Kassam to the exam room. Thank you so very much for being here. Oh, thank you, Chuck. It's always a pleasure. You keep quite busy just reading through that bio right at the top. I mean, where do you find all of the time? <laughs> Gosh, that's a tough one. Lockdown's helped for sure. <laughs> it's kept us from socializing, so that always gives me time. But no, I mean, you know what it's like, you know, when you find a passion for something and the information is urgent um, to get out there, you find the time um, to, to, to put towards these important um, topics. Speaking of the lockdown and the pandemic over the past year, almost year and a half at this point, here in the U.S., I kind of get the feeling that a lot of people are taking a more keen interest in their health. Have you seen the same thing over where you are? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think um, it's highlighted, you know, firstly, the vulnerabilities of the um, UK population, you know, the fact that we have quite a burden of chronic illness. And it has, um, you know, um, sparked people's interest in taking control of um, their own health and using healthy lifestyle habits to get back into shape, get their fitness back online, healthy weight and, and try and prevent illness in the future. And trying to prevent illness is a big part of what it is you do as a doctor, but then also what you will be speaking about at ICNM here uh, next month. And your your presentation is all about cancer prevention and survival, as we mentioned. And I'm just curious what your opinion is as far as how aware the average person is that their health, specifically in this case with cancer, is so intricately linked with their diet and their lifestyle. Yeah, interesting question. And it is something I cover because and we've had a couple of recent surveys, one from the US and one from the UK, asking just that question, you know, how many people are aware about the World Cancer Research Fund cancer prevention guidelines? And it's way below 50%. You know, it's not unusual for people to be unaware of the fact that processed red meat and alcohol and being an unhealthy weight all contribute to their risk of cancer. So I, I think that's going to be one of my key messages that as health professionals, we have to get the message out there because we've known about this for decades. And it took a number of years for people to really make that connection with cigarettes and cancer. Do you think, though, that processed meat like you were just talking about or red meat, grilled meat, all of that, do you think that we'll ever reach a point in our lifetime where people are equating processed meat the same way that they would with cigarettes in terms of health and cancer risk? I really, really hope so. And it's something that we're passionate about at Plant Based Health Professionals UK, because, you know, just to be in a hospital where I work, King's College Hospital, and to walk into the staff or the, 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 the patient canteen and look at their menus and see processed meat served on there, it's just so contradictory to the evidence. But, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves that it took 50 years um, certainly in the UK, to remove smoking from hospital grounds 50 years since we understood for sure that it caused cancer. So, you know, we're only six years down the line when it comes to processed red meat. So we've got some time to go. And, and the market forces and, you know, that, are, that are, are keeping those unhealthy foods in our environment are so strong and powerful. It, it's an uphill battle. Yeah, there is a lot of big money behind that, a lot of slick marketing dollars, um, and, and it will be interesting. But when you look at it in terms of comparing it to smoking, the tobacco industry had massive amounts of funding as well. So if, you, if we're using that same 50-year timeline, even though we're only six years in right now, the battle seems to be, at least financially, 
fairly similar. So that does give me hope, a little bit of optimism for where we would be even, you know, two decades from now. It's all about making progress and heading in that right direction. And as you said at the top, you know, people are a little bit more interested in their health. They're able to take this time during the pandemic and look inward um, and see if they can identify areas where they can improve. And a lot of times for a lot of us, that does in fact begin with uh, diet. Um, here's an interesting question, Dr. Kassam. Generally speaking, in your estimation, how many or what percentage would you say of cancer cases could be prevented if somebody was eating a healthier diet, was more active, they had that healthier lifestyle as well? We talk a lot about prevention, whether it be with cancer or any other chronic illness, but if somebody is really plugged into what it is that they're eating, how they're living their life, what percentage of cancer cases do you think would just, we would be seeing, you know, how yeah. much is preventable? So the estimates from all the um, cancer organizations, including the World Cancer Research Fund, is that four out of 10 cancers could be prevented. Um, and clearly that varies based on individual cancer types. So um, for bowel cancer, for example, more than 50% of cases could be prevented. For breast cancer, it's about 25%. And those are our kind of two common um, cancers. Um, but overall, four out of 10 could be prevented by healthier lifestyle and diet. That's uh, still a, a very significant uh, percentage. If somebody tells you you have a 40% chance of winning the lottery, I think that you're going to jump at those odds any day of the week. So why wouldn't you want to do everything that you can in your power to try to, to try to win that lottery? Um, and I think that also that 40% brings with it an awful lot of hope because a lot of people feel resigned to the fact that their genetics are 100% the driving factor as to whether or not they will get cancer. You see your mom, your sister, they have breast cancer. You assume that that's it for you. You see your grandmother, maybe she had it as well. And that's, that's not the case. What kind of conversations have you had with patients where that light bulb kind of goes off in their head and they're like, oh my gosh, I have way more control over this than I thought. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's a question people ask all the time. Um, you know, and I get people at, at the moment when they're really receptive to this information, because they've just been, you know, just been given some bad news. And they're worrying about their family members and their children, and how is it going to affect them? And they're like, what can I do? And what can my family do? So yeah, people are really interested. But as you say, there's been, you know, study after study, and I'm going to cover one particular one in the conference, showing that, you know, despite the fact that you might might be at higher risk of cancers like colorectal cancer and breast cancer, you can still make a big difference in your chance of, of developing that cancer during your lifetime. And I think one of the reasons that people think that cancer's in, in my family, for example, is because that one out of two of us are going to develop cancer in our lifetime. So that it's so prevalent now that we think it's inevitable, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do our utmost to lower our risk. And it's a good news story here as well. You know, of course, we can't prevent every single illness and we certainly can't prevent all cancer. But if you come and see me as a cancer doctor in a better shape without heart disease, without type 2 diabetes, without high blood pressure, you're going to do better with the treatment um, and also making those healthy lifestyle changes even after a diagnosis of cancer can really, really make a difference to um, your chances of staying in remission and surviving longer. So, you know, it's really never too late when it comes to cancer. Let's talk about that and, and, and just use a comparison here. Let's say that somebody comes to you and they've been quite fond of those processed meats and French fries and uh, crisps, okay? So they're eating all of that high fat food that's uh, you know, not going to do them any favors, right? So, but then the other person who has been eating that they get the diagnosis, they're, they're in treatment now, but they do begin to eat that healthier diet filled with plants, whole food, plant-based. They start becoming a little bit more active, taking walks. What kind of a different outcome are they looking at? You know, you could even use the epigenetics and say that there are twins, you know, so one person's eating the hamburger, the other person's eating the veggie burger. How much different might their outcome actually be once they're going through treatment? 
Yeah, no, interesting question. And I think we've got a lot of information for the common cancers, so breast, prostate and colorectal, because obviously that's most widely studied. And, you know, the difference you can make is around the order of somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. So say, you know, 30 re percent um, re in reducing your risk of, you know, succumbing to the cancer, for example. So, um, you know, it's a really sizable um, improvement you can make by making those changes there and then after the diagnosis of cancer. So we know that uh, red meat, processed meat, those are the bad ones, anything that's really high in fat. Are there any other foods that you've come across that should be really avoided that are really more likely to cause cancer than others? Yeah. And, you know, I like to talk about what we should be adding in to crowd out the, the less good things. So, you know, not about what we need to give up, um, because what you're exchanging it for is, you know, amazing, healthy, whole plant foods. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to rank foods, it's going to be red and processed meat is, is definitely got to be left off um, the plate. And then you can make better choices, you know, um, we, we it often gets complicated talking about dairy um but what i tell people is that you can really make a better choice for yourself you know dairy is not necessary and has the potential to cause harm and increases the risk of certain cancers like prostate cancer and may increase your risk of endometrial cancer and breast cancer but you know regardless of what that causes you know if you swap it in for you know healthy soya foods and soya milk you can actually reduce your risk of developing certain cancers and you know live longer and healthier with with the soya foods rather than the the dairy and i think the other big kind of no no are the ultra processed foods and those that are high in sugar you know they may not directly cause cancer but they you know they increase inflammation in the body they um, add extra unhealthy pounds to your weight, all of which kind of contribute to that risk of cancer and doing less well um, at, after the diagnosis. Um, and yeah, sugary drinks, you know, no place in, in, in the diet. We need to be drinking water for thirst and, you know, add in teas and coffees. There's so many good um, teas that you can drink and they're all healthful and even coffee's not a bad thing for cancer. I love the way that you said crowd out the unhealthy foods, right? That's such a positive approach to look at it. Um, my question, though, is food is very much a comfort thing. And I think that that is a global relationship that we all have when it comes to food. If we're having a bad day, something's going wrong, we just immediately go to those foods that we love so much and we kind of wrap ourselves in it like a warm blanket to try to feel better. And I think that anytime somebody is facing a diagnosis as serious as cancer, that can be quite scary. And so what do you what do you want? You want to be comforted at that point. So perhaps they're more inclined then to go back to those unhealthy foods. Have you talked to a patient who might be struggling with that? Like, yeah, doc, I know I should be eating better, but I feel so bad. I'm so scared right now. All I want in the world is this big bowl of ice cream. What advice could you give that person? <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one. And it's not just for people with cancer, of course, you know, you have a bad day and you want something comforting. And the thing is, sometimes you don't have to resist, you know, we're not going to be perfect 100% of the time. Um, I think, you know, so if you're craving it, have it. But I think it's about creating your home environment. And when you go and socialize your environment um, with your friends and your families, one that, you know, really, you're not driven to to having these foods close at hand. Um, so, you know, don't be putting it regularly in your shopping basket, make it make sure that you have to actually exit your house to eat these foods. Um, and, you know, you'll soon change your taste buds and want to have more healthy foods once you start, as I say, crowding out those less healthy foods. And I think we probably have to be reaching for sort of more natural ways of feeling well, like doing a bit of exercise, like spending a bit of time in nature, like, you know, you and I would take our dog for a walk or, or um, you know, you would spend some time with a friend. So I think it's kind of just changing those habits um, and finding comfort in more healthy activities, really. This That brings up an interesting point to me. And I get so many emails from viewers and listeners who 
I, they just feel deflated because they've fallen off the vegan wagon, okay? So they've had a cheat day and they went from eating this really clean, whole food, plant-based, healthy diet. And then for whatever reason, maybe they're out with friends um, or they're just having a bad day. They go back to that pizza that has the full-blown dairy on it, or they reach for that bowl of ice cream or that hamburger, whatever that Chris may be. Your message just then was one that I think that a lot of people can feel better about is that if you do slip, essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but if you do slip, don't stress too much about it. Not everything's going to fall off the rails. Just make sure that you go right back to eating that healthy diet. I think so. I think, you know, we've learned to talk about, you know, overall healthy diet patterns. It doesn't have to be perfect 100% of the time because what, what is in our life? And sometimes we just don't have control over it. You know, if I walked into my hospital as a patient, I don't, I hope I don't have to, but I probably won't find the healthiest plant-based food. So you make the best choices you can at that moment. And sometimes you have a treat, but I think, you know, as long as you're aiming for an overall healthy diet pattern and making sure that that is accessible to you most of the time. I want to switch gears and get kind of a little bit nerdy with you because as I was doing research for this interview, in your bio, it mentioned that you had done research on selenium and chemotherapy mm -hmm. and identified that it actually can really help as far as the effectiveness of chemotherapy. So why, why is there? What's the connection here? What exactly did you study? Yeah, no, it's interesting because that probably was my first foray into thinking about nutrition. And I just, you know, happened upon a pro project that seemed interesting and, and got the position. So it was just by chance, really. And yeah, at the time, there was a lot of interest in using selenium at higher doses, so higher doses that, that you would normally consume on a daily basis. Um, for its antioxidant properties and its ability to sort of kill cancer cells while at the same time, um, you know, preventing the death of normal cells, you know, the kind of the holy grail of a, a good cancer treatment. Um, and, um, and there was a big study going on at the time looking at its role in cancer prevention. But being a cancer doctor, I was looking at its effects in the laboratory um, using human cells. Um, and seeing whether combining selenium with regular chemotherapy drugs could enhance um, the efficacy. And it did seem that that was occurring in the laboratory with human cell lines, that you could enhance the efficacy of, of chemotherapy because selenium enhanced cancer cell death. It induced this um, cell death process called autophagy. It also turned on sort of, you know, um, uh, cancer death signals in the cell. So I was able to sort of outline all that at the kind of molecular level. But I mean, it's also a, a learning of, um, uh, to, to me on a personal level, you know, because we did want to put this out into clinical trials, you know, do a do a combination trial with chemotherapy and high doses of sel seleniums in a randomized study and just could not get the support or the funding to do such a nutraceutical um, study because, you know, our research agenda in the UK is driven by the pharma industry. So it sort of died a slow death, <laughs> as it were, um, and it didn't really make it outside of my PhD thesis. Um, but also what I've learned since is that I, I don't think that's really the approach to cancer. I mean, it's never really worked before isolating um, single nutrients from food and hoping that it will have a, a, an extra effect. And sometimes we find that it has a worse effect when you put you when you put it into human trials. So I think the concept probably wasn't right. So it was just as well. <laughs> Do you think by and large, we can run into trouble by hyper focusing on a single nutrient or a single food, which we tend so often to do as humans? Yeah, I think so. I think we're all looking for that quick fix, the, the one food, the one pill. Um, but, you know, time and time again, studies have shown, you know, we've had studies of beta carotene and people who are trying to prevent lung cancer and actually increase the risk of lung cancer in smokers. Um, at the same time I was doing my research, there was a study looking at preventing prostate cancer with selenium tablets. And actually it didn't do that. And it possibly increased the risk of type two diabetes. So I think in the words of T. Colin Campbell, you know, our reductionist approach really hasn't done us any good. And when it comes, a, comes to food as medicine, we have to eat the real food. And also, I'm very much one for 
for recommending variety rather than getting stuck on the individual f- food like you know the broccoli sprouts or the you know the lycopene and the tomatoes you know fine we know a lot about these things but really we have to eat a varied and diverse plant-based diet so by and large basically uh, all these nutrients they kind of work in conjunction with each other to give you the healthiest body possible is that kind of the message here Absolutely. I think we just don't understand all the interactions and even pretending that we do just often leads to mishaps. You know, you extract one thing and you think you know what that extract is doing, but actually it's doing a billion other things. And, you know, it's not it's the same with the kind of medicines that I use to treat cancer, you know, with the chemotherapy, you know, when some that are good, some that are less good, you know, resulting in side effects that you didn't really anticipate. So I think it's the same with nutritional supplements as well. I believe I also read in your bio that you have uh, taken a keen focus on lymphoma as well. That's one of the, the forms of cancer that you've really studied in depth. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I only treat lymphoma, actually. So although I sort of speak about cancer prevention and everything, but my my day job is treating people with lymphoma, which here in the UK is kind of the sixth commonest cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, It's not just one disease, though. It's like 40 different um, diseases all in one. (laughs) Well, if if you don't mind, indulge me. Uh, We actually uh, got a question from a viewer last week, and I thought that you would be the perfect person to ask. And this was uh, somebody who hit me up on Instagram, wanted to know, can a whole food plant-based diet protect against the recurrence of lymphoma? They say that they were treated for non-Hodgkin sinus lymphoma a few years ago, uh, but recurrence is still on their mind fairly often. Yeah, interesting question. And clearly, I get asked that um, a a lot. So we haven't got, um, you know, strong evidence for that at all. You know, the studies haven't been done, because as I say, there's so many different lymphoma subtypes, that doing large scale studies on all the different ones to answer that question just haven't and won't ever be done. I have written a review article in the International Journal of Disease Prevention and Reversal in their first issue about what we know on non-Hodgkin lymphoma and diet and nutrition. And when you look at the data, it's the same themes that come up, you know, and it is that red and processed meat are not good and, you know, an array of um, diverse, colourful vegetables are beneficial Um, but we don't have the answers to whether you know you'll live longer or whether you'll stay in remission but the one thing that I would say that bothers me a lot is that even though I'm lucky enough to be able to tell patients that you know we'll probably be able to get rid of your cancer and it doesn't come back you know that's often the case with some of our common lymphomas um my patients are going to live less long than the general average person because they're dying early of second cancers and they're dying of cardiovascular disease, partly because of some of the treatments that we've given. So what I would say, and I say to my patients, is that in order to reduce your risk of those um, things happening, um, adopting a plant-based diet is really the best thing that you can do because it reduces cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and hopefully the chance of getting other second cancers, which is which is a common occurrence. Well, to that end, let's see if uh, we can talk to those people who have stayed with that poor diet virtually their entire lives. And at this point, say they're in their 50s, they're in their 60s, maybe even older, and they've just been eating like garbage their entire lives. Is there still hope for them if they adopt these lifestyle changes, if they begin to eat that healthier diet, that despite the fact that they've been eating all those decades that unhealthy food, that because they stopped that and now they're eating that that cleaner diet, that they could still lower their risk? It's not too late. Yeah, agreed. And, um, you know, on a kind of population level, that's sort of been shown, you know, people who do make um, lifestyle changes, and especially when it results in a more healthy weight, which is a particular problem for the countries we both live in, Chuck, um, you know, you can really significantly reduce your risk uh, of cancers, especially those that are associated with being an unhealthy weight. So I think in that direction, you can. And it's similarly with alcohol as well. I get 
I'm quite annoyed that people don't consider alcohol, um, you know, in the way that we should, um, and it's still socially acceptable. But you know, stopping alcohol then does significantly then in the future reduce your risk of developing alcohol-related um, cancers. So absolutely, it's difficult to quantify how much good you'll do, but there's no doubt you will. And I think the other thing that's not talked about enough is that you know, underlying chronic illnesses like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, renal problems, high blood pressure, etc. They all increase your risk of developing cancer. So even if all you did was wipe out your type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, which we know is entirely possible, then you would also be reducing your risk of developing cancer. Alcohol is, is a funny thing. Uh, we were talking about comfort foods earlier, but I think a lot of people even turn to alcohol for that same reason, or even just to celebrate, right? I, I've seen people who have celebrated uh, the fact that uh, doctors have declared their cancer in remission by going out and having a beer or having that glass of wine or toasting a glass of champagne to their, their health. And having done this show now for the past four years, I'm kind of scratching my head by that. Why don't you think that that is being more discussed, that connection that's so pronounced? Why don't you think doctors are talking about that? Yeah, and I was, it's funny. I mean, I get ridiculed when I bring this up at work. You know, we had a leaving do for one of my consultant colleagues and I was asking, what should we get him? And they were like, oh, well, he loves wine and whiskey. And I was thinking, you know, it's so un it's so odd that we think it's socially acceptable to buy another doctor a group one carcinogen. But, you know, clearly other people don't think the way that I do. Um, and I think it's just that. It's been made socially acceptable and it's associated with all the things that we think we enjoy, you know, time with our friends and family, you know. And as you say, it sort of temporarily makes us feel a bit better. You know, it takes away some anxieties in the in the moment. Clearly, it doesn't do that in the longer term. It makes you relax. And, um, you know, we enjoy that. And I think, again, it comes down to some rather good PR and marketing um, that, it, unfortunately, doctors have fallen into the same trap. But it's and again, you know, smoking is the same analogy. Uh, doctors were advertising cigarettes back in the 50s. You know, um, doctors continue to consume alcohol. And I think we know we have to be real, role models. You know, I think doctors advise or, or, or support their patients with the habits that they're also used to um, uh, sticking with. So, um, you know, I think that's why it's still accepted as, as, as an okay activity. So if you were organizing uh, the gift uh, for this person among your colleagues, what would you have gotten them <laughs> instead of that whiskey or instead of that wine? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I'd probably like a 28-day plant-based challenge or something, but I think I would have been <laughs> absolutely ridiculed. Yeah, sadly, sadly not. But um, yeah, anyway, it, it, it's, it, it is interesting, isn't it? Just even in, in the hospital space, how, how alcohol is, is turned to. I, I worked with a um, a consultant long time ago that when their patients reached the 25 year mark of remission, he would give them a bottle of champagne. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, you know, the, that 50 year process for uh, processed meat and making that association uh, with cancer. So maybe, you know, in a, in a few more decades, maybe people will start making that connection there as well. I do honestly, in my heart of hearts, believe that we are trending slowly but surely in that direction. So hopefully things will continue to progress and even accelerate over time. And to that end, to that end, I want to ask you about the appetite for uh, lifestyle medicine over in the UK and what it is that you have been working on there. I know that you're really doing some exciting things. So how interested uh, are people in the UK on, in lifestyle medicine and the idea of adopting a plant-based diet? Yeah, so, well, that's two slightly different things. So I think, so lifestyle medicine has really taken off as an area of interest in the UK, especially amongst healthcare professionals and primary care doctors who are really looking for a different a way, different way of approaching healthcare because, you know, we've all got stuck and fed up of, you know, firefighting and, and treating disease. We want 
to be there upfront with preventing disease in the first place and offering patients and clients a different way of approaching their health that removes the, the centerpiece of medication and, and you know pills and procedures as they say. Um, so that has really increased. Now the topic of nutrition as part of lifestyle medicine continues to be one that's argued about but from my um, work with Plant-Based Health Professionals UK we are a growing membership of healthcare professionals of people who have found and used plant-based nutrition in the clinical practice so it is growing slowly um, and as you say um, what we've done in the UK is launch a plant-based lifestyle medicine service and we've called it plant-based health online to be up front and center that we're using a plant-based approach but we also use the other you know six pillars of lifestyle medicine um, to really improve people's health and give them an alternative to um, medication and a lifetime of chronic illness and, and medication side effects. So, so people in the UK and actually abroad as well, a bit, it's a bit like your US plant-based telehealth. We've got plant-based health online where you can book an appointment online, see a GP, a nutritionist, a dietitian, who will support you to make those healthy lifestyle changes either one-to-one -one or we're also starting group consultations as well. And we've had charity funding to support cancer survivorship um, program for individuals like we've been talking about you know you've had your diagnosis of cancer you want to make a healthy change how do you do it and how do you do it in an evidence-based way so you support your health going forward so yeah we're really excited and my co-founder Dr Laura Freeman she's a cancer survivor herself actually she's a GP lifestyle medicine physician all-round phenomenal person and she's the medical director of that organization. So when you, you're talking about GPs, is this a service that somebody could use for primary care, as we call it here in the States? Yeah, I mean, it is primary care because it's sort of dealing with chronic illness, but that, that, that doesn't take away from the fact that you have your own NHS um, GP, which everyone has. So it's sort of above and beyond that, but we communicate with primary and secondary care in the same way as, as you would. And in the in England, at least, we have a regulator called the Care Quality Commission, and we're regulated in the same way as other healthcare facilities. So we have to meet standards for being safe and efficacious and, you know, treating our patients and with dignity and all, all those things that matter. So we're a regulated service, but using lifestyle first. So that's uh, one of our um, overarching themes is lifestyle first, but working together in a patient-centered way. And when a person, uh, when a patient first comes to you, is there kind of a comprehensive review of their lifestyle? And does the nutritionist go over with them what it is that their, their current menu is and how it could be better? Yeah, I mean, obviously, with having plant-based in, in the name, people are finding us because they've either tried or want to try sort of a plant uh, uh, predominant diet. Um, they all fill in a questionnaire before they actually have their appointment. So we have a bit of information. We have some information already on the website and a starter guide. So we often find that people have sort of made a start in that direction. And then, yeah, depending on what their underlying um, uh, health challenges or what their hopes and desires are for their health care, then they are supported to make those healthy changes either by a doctor or a dietitian or a nutritionist, wh whatever um, works um, best for them. We have a dietitian who specializes in fertility and gut disorders. We have a nutritionist who's, who's very knowledgeable about athletes and the nutrition. So it's not just about illness, it's about also achieving the best you can using a lifestyle first approach. I love that. You got a little something for everybody there. And that's mm -hmm. from the patient perspective, but you too are also, you're giving a, a university course for healthcare professionals as well. So talk to me about what that is. Yeah, so, you know, once I discovered all this information rather late in my career as a doctor, I thought, well, why isn't anyone talking about it and, and providing the education? And I was really lucky to be introduced to the then um, Vice Chancellor of Winchester University, Joy Carter, and she was vegan. She was really interested in um, preventative health care. They were just about to launch their health and well-being facility or faculty, sorry, at Winchester University. So um, they took on my proposal. And for the last two years, I've been running an online 
CPD accredited course for um, healthcare professionals at Winchester University. It's um, It's been taken up sort of internationally really and it's been accredited by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine too so it can count towards the CPD required to maintain the diploma in lifestyle medicine and we've had some quite famous um, participants. Dr Michael Clapper did the course as well just to spy on me and make sure he approved it. <laughs> so um, we've had some good recommendations. <laughs> Fantastic. And I tell you what, we will uh, put up a link to that in the episode notes for this as well. Dr. Shireen Kassam, that is all the time that we have here today. I wish that we did have more time. I would love to have you back on again in the future. I'd love to come back, Chuck, and I'm really looking forward to the conference. And in the interim, exactly, you will be speaking at the conference Thursday, July 15th, one of the first speakers right out of the gate. And if you head to pcrm.org slash ICNM right now, you can register and save $50 when you use the promo code exam room, all one word, use the promo code exam room, to save $50. And of course, watch Dr. Shireen Kassam and her incredible presentation. Thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.